Perfect. So uh, today the goal for discussion is to understand the control design So in the previous class, we talked about state space model for uh, designing controllers. So the idea was we have a state equation xt plus 1 equals to f of xt ut wt. We have observation which is yt equals to g of xt vt. My control action is a function of gamma t. So the, my control action ut is a function gamma t of y1 all the way up to yt. So I look at the entire history of observations and then I decide what my control action is. Uh, in some cases, yt is equals to xt. And so we design the control policy as a function of the state xt itself, if we can measure the entire state of the system. On the other hand, if we cannot measure the state of the system, then of course we have to use sensors. Uh, we might use some other approximate sensors, in which case uh, it will be a function of the xt and perhaps some sort of sensor noise. So the goal today is, so in the previous class we talked about for different applications, what are xt, what are ut, what is wt, what is vt. But we haven't yet talked about this function gamma t. So gamma t is encompassing based on the observations that I have made or based on the states that I have seen, what exactly, how should I compute what the action should be. What's the simplest gamma t you can think of? What is the, so you are acting on a day-to-day -day basis, you are figuring out what to eat, you are figuring out what to drink, you are figuring out when to sleep. So what's the simplest gamma t that you apply based on the observations you are making about your surrounding? So the simplest gamma t is rule-based policy. which could be something like uh, which could be something like if yt is above a threshold do this if yt is below a threshold do something else right so in the case of thermostat when we set it on cooling and we set the temperature to 72 degrees fahrenheit we measure the temperature yt if it is above 72 degrees fahrenheit well not 72 degrees but if it is above 72.5 or 73 degrees Fahrenheit, we turn on the AC. <clears throat> if it is below 72.5 uh, or 73 degrees Fahrenheit, we don't turn on the AC. Okay, so that's a simple rule-based policy. That rule-based policy is what most of the thermostats are using. Okay, so rule-based is very simple. You have to cook it up in your head and then you implement, you write a simple code in the uh, in either programmable logic controller or in the microcontroller or in Arduino or Raspberry Pi, whatever stuff you're using to control that particular hardware, uh, you just write a simple rule-based method which you can cook up in your head and then you can implement it. It doesn't take a lot of effort. The only thing that you need to be aware of in rule-based system is that your rules cannot be so complex that it takes a lot of time to compute what the output yt, uh, output ut is going to be. Okay, so if it takes a lot of effort, if it takes uh, 10 milliseconds to compute it, it could be bad for your system. So all you have to be worried about is, even in rule-based system, you want to make sure that the rules are such that you can actually implement, execute that whole rule in a few milliseconds or a few microseconds depending on the system at hand. Uh, how much time do you think, so you know, uh, do you guys have uh, GFCI enabled circuit breakers in your bathrooms, right? So you'll be a test and reset button and if you press the test button it, it trips, okay? So how much time do you think it takes to trip? It's a hardware driven approach, it's not really a rule, I mean, 
the rule is there is no rule getting computed in a microcontroller it's actually hardware driven but it typically takes of the order of microseconds to react so if there is a short circuit it senses the short circuit and it trips that particular plug uh, socket in the matter of a few microseconds okay so in some cases it is important that the rules no matter how sophisticated or simple the rule is executes within microseconds the second one uh, the second class of control design techniques i'm going to assume that yt is equal to xt in this case and i'm also going to assume that xt is an r so it's all real numbers scalar variable not a vector so you could have something like a pid controller uh, which basically means that ut oh i need to introduce the error term i have not introduced error term okay so let's talk about pid so in pid uh, we have a reference signal let me call it rt so i want xt to track rt or maybe i'll uh, no i won't use rt let me call it x bar t so i have a reference signal x bar t and i want to make sure that my xt is as close to x bar t as possible so i'll define an error signal e of t xt minus x bar t which is the error so xt is my current state x bar t is what i would like it to be at this point of time so in the case of this room the temperature is set at 72 degrees fahrenheit so 72 degrees fahrenheit is the reference signal and the current temperature is 72.3 degrees fahrenheit and that is my x of t okay so this is the reference this is the true signal so i define the error uh and then my ut is kp of et plus ki of summation of es so kp ki and kd these are all some constants and the constants are tuned using the stuff you guys have studied in 3551 in the feedback controls class okay so i have this error signal and then i multiply the error with a constant i add up all the errors so far multiplied by a constant i take the difference of the successive errors and i multiply it by a constant i add all this thing up that gives me ut this is my gamma t this is my rule and this is known as a pid controller this is known as a pid controller you could have a lead lag controller as well where ut will be equal to alpha is between 0 and 
I mean, lead lag is more complicated, but either lead will look like this or lag com compensator will look like this, or you can have a lead lag compensator in successive with different values of KP and K, and that'll give you a lead lag compensator. And so, anyway, so this is what the thing looks like. So you take a decaying term, you multiply it by the previous errors, multiply it by a constant, you take the current error, multiply it by another constant, you get your control action. <clears throat> so typically what you will see is if ET equals to zero, which means that my XT is tracking the reference signal exactly, the action value becomes zero, which means you are doing nothing. Things are just working out as intended. On the other hand, if XT is different from X bar T, then all of these values will be non-zero. As a result of which, there'll be non-trivial UT that will get implemented on the system. So we've talked about rule-based controller. We've talked about uh, PID as well as a lead lag controller. What's the third way to design? Uh, both of these, by the way, this, this uh, PID control design and lead lag control design is part of 3551. So, which is of course a prerequisite for this class, but I think some of you are taking it concurrently. So, in that class, the whole purpose of 3551 is to figure out what the KP, KI, KD, KP and K should be. Like this is all you study in the entire class. So, depending on this function F, and of course, yt is equal to xt and xt is in r. So depending on this function f, and there is no wt in uh, many of those cases, the question is to how to design gamma t. And so you study 30, in 3551, you study how you design gamma t for a specific subclass of systems. The third one, which is the subject of 5500, another course that I'm teaching right now, uh, in this semester is using optimization based method. Why do we need optimization? What is it that we are trying to optimize? Can you give an example of a specific Autonomous system where something needs to be optimized? Car. car. What do you want to optimize in car? Uh, like if it is an electric, then uh, we are talking about battery. If it is a gasoline, then we are talking about gas. Yeah. So you can, you can try to optimize the fuel consumption or the energy consumption of the vehicle. Okay. So that's an optimization based gamma T. Anything else? Any other system that comes to the mind where you want to optimize something Any while you are controlling? Yeah. Uh, CPU or memory performance, like allocation there, Right, so that's true. Uh, technically, it is also a control design, but uh, we don't really study it. It's not an autonomous system which is actually moving or behaving in the wild. But that's also, you can think of it as a control system and you can design how you allocate memory in a processing unit. Any other example? So you want to optimize energy, what else can you optimize? Uh, maybe like AI performance or accuracy. Can you give a concrete example? Uh, so maybe in terms of like machine learning, if you're trying to uh, design some sort of algorithm that recognizes an image. Right. Or something specific, and an image wants to optimize how well that performs. Right, but that's not a control system. There's no action that you are taking. Yes? Heating and cooling for a room, like, like Heating and cooling, so energy consumption of heating and cooling system. So this is a, he, this is a cooling system right now in, inside this room, and you would want to optimize energy consumption there. Anything else you want to optimize? Sometimes you also try to optimize risk, okay? So when you are trying to design uh, 
I mean, typically risks are more seen in, uh, in uh, any safety critical system. So what are safety, like when you're driving a vehicle, you maintain a distance in front with respect to the vehicle in front, and that's purely out of risk consideration. So you can reduce the distance with the vehicle in front, and of course there are some drivers who drive <laughs> very close to the vehicle in front, but uh, it basically leads to a risky behavior. So we, sometimes we want to optimize risk okay, in uh, safety critical systems. Uh, sometimes we want to optimize long-term performance. So for instance, uh, in the case of electric vehicles, you don't want to, whenever you press a hard brake, you don't want the entire regenerated electricity to go to the battery. So you just send part of it to the battery and the rest of it gets dissipated as heat. So those are also cases where you design your control strategy based on some optimization metric. So in order to do optimization based gamma T design, you first have to have a performance metric. So we call the performance metric It's called a cost, and it is given by C of xt, ut, wt. So if my, act, if my state is xt, if my action is ut, and if my noise variable is wt, then I incur a cost C of these three variables. Okay, so C is a function. C is known as the cost function. It's a function of the state, action, and noise. And now the way to optimize it is to set up the problem like this. I want to minimize over all gamma t, t equals one to capital C t, summation of C of x t, u t, w t, t equals one to capital T. And then I'm taking an expectation. I know we have not talked about expectation yet, but we will be talking about it very soon when we start the review of probability in statistics. So we look at the expectation of this entire cost function, like the total cost function. And this is of course subject to xt plus one equals to f of xt ut wt and yt equals to g of xt vt. In addition to these constraints, you could also have a constraint such as H of xt, ut, yt is equal to zero or less than equal to zero, something like this. So you could have some other constraints on the state action as well as the observation. You could have some constraints which has to be met as well. So in the case of the battery example that we talked about, what is the constraint on the system? What kind of constraints do batteries have? We just discussed it. The total amount of current that you can send to the battery for charging purposes or for discharging purposes. So many a times in order to maintain a certain life of the battery, you want to make sure that even though the battery can handle currents much, much larger than what you can, uh, much, much larger than the threshold, you don't want to send the maximum amount of charge to the battery, maximum amount of current to the battery, because that might degrade the battery's performance over long periods of time. So you might want to put some constraints on the amount of current that you are uh, giving to the battery in order to recharge it at the time of a heartbreaking event. Okay, so you have, this is the total cost function. This is called the total performance metric or total cost function. I'm taking the expectation because we have some noises in the system. So I'm taking, I'm averaging over all that noise. Uh, I'm averaging the performance over all those noise variables. It is of course naturally subject to these dynamical constraints of the system, but you could also have additional constraints on the system, uh, which, uh, 
wherein you are trying to constrain the set of actions that are available uh, so that you don't want the system to become uh, uh, non-performing in the future. So that's why you add this additional constraint in the system. In the case of wind farms, you don't want a lot of flutter. So you design the, not just you design, but you actually design the controller for the wind. Um, what is that called? So you know the blade, the, the, the blades of the wind farm, it can actually move, uh, it can rotate. So the blades, the, the, the algorithm for rotating the blades of the wind farm are written in a manner that it doesn't create a lot of flutter. Flutter is movement like this. So you don't want to create any flutter because that would, uh, that would harm the blades, blade material over long periods of time. So flutter once in a while is okay. But if you have flutters every day from morning till evening, the blades are going to uh, uh, break very, very, very quickly. And so that's why you don't want that to happen. So you could have constraints due to flutter. You can have constraints due to the physical quantities, the physical limitations of the hardware. So all of that is basically uh, constrained by this uh, variable or function here. So this is optimization based method. Uh, any question on the optimization based gamma t? We have not talked about how to compute this gamma t, but we will talk about it very soon. First we go through this introductory stuff. Any question on gamma t? No? Uh, yes. You said we don't consider flutter. Basically, you mean to say we are also optimizing flutter? Yeah, you can add a constraint that is optimizing the flutter. The problem is this cost is a short term cost. This is the cost for the next one hour, next 24 hours, next 48 hours. This is where you look at all the long term metrics and you try to constrain the short term actions so as to maintain the long term performance. Any other question? Yes. Should the constraints be probabilistic or should it have expectations? Perfect. So when, you, when I was talking about you can maintain risk, you can minimize risk. So then you put the probabilistic constraints as well. So there you will have like a probability of this less than equal to zero is greater than equal to 75%, 95%, whatever. So emissions, for instance, is one such constraint. So you, of course, want to have emissions controlled in a vehicle. But if you're speeding up, let's say you are entering a highway and you're speeding up, you are going to not meet the emission standards. But once you are coasting on the highway, you can meet the emission standard. Now, how many times are you accelerating uh, to go from zero miles per hour to 70 miles per hour? Well, that's going to happen maybe like only 1% of the driving time. And rest of the 99%, you are going to be on the highway. So as a result of which you are not meeting the emission standards only 1% of the time, but you're meeting it 99% of the time. So those are the probabilistic constraints. Uh, of course, we are not going to study that in this class, but that's a field of its own and it's extremely complicated to design gamma t when you have probabilistic constraints. Any other question? Awesome. So this is uh, optimization based. Now, the next is adaptive control, which is actually very important for this class. So what happens in adaptive control? So remember I was telling you about this function f that dictates the state transition equation. Uh, sometimes what happens is that the function itself changes. This function f itself changes over time. I'll give you a very simple example. When we are, uh, when we are on a flight, imagine an international flight, it takes 10, 15 hours of flying time. When it is taking off, it has a certain mass. When it is touching down, it has a different mass. And the difference between that mass is the amount of fuel that gets burned in the flight. And many a times it is a substantial amount of fuel. It is of the order of thousands of uh, kilograms. What happens is that the state, the equation of motion of the flight changes over time, okay? 
So at a, diff at a beginning of the flight, it has a different equation of motion because the mass is different. At the end of the flight, it has a different equation of motion because the mass is different. Now, so in those cases, what happens is this f itself is changing, and so you need to design gamma t so that the function, so that the system is behaving accordingly, according to your design throughout the process. So that is studied under the umbrella of adaptive control, wherein you have a system, there are some parameters that you don't know, or the parameters that are changing over time, and you don't upfront know how those parameters are going to change. So what you do is you design an adaptive controller so you design gamma t that takes into account all of this past information. You design gamma t in a way that your system is still behaving according to the design, according to the plan. So without going into the mathematics of adaptive control here, because that's a subject of its own and we'll be talking about it in the subsequent classes, there's no easy way to do it, uh, to, to study adaptive control. But uh, the goal there is to make sure that we are as close, the error ET is as close to zero as possible. Uh, so what we do is we tune, you remember we were talking about this KP and K variables here. So we basically keep changing the KP and K over time based on the error signals that we are receiving. And that's how we get the value of UT. Okay, so that is adaptive controller. Now why adaptive control is important for cybersecurity? Once you detect an attack, right, or if there is an attack on the system, this function f may change because some information that you were expecting is not coming in, some information that, or even g can change. So g can change when you expected some sensor to give you the information, but it's not giving the information. That is a denial of service attack. Uh, in some cases, uh, the temperature was supposed to give, tell me the temperature of the room, but I went and put my hand in front of the temperature sensor, and now it's giving my body temperature, not the room temperature, right? So I'm actually changing, I'm actively changing the temperature reading that is going to the thermostat. So that's another uh, attack, deception attack, onto the system. So depending on the attack on the system, this function f may change or this function g may change. And so depending on what has changed, whether G has changed or F has changed, an appropriate algorithm needs to be implemented. And specifically, if F has changed, then we need to do adaptive control because we don't quite know what the new F looks like. Um, you might have some idea, okay, that this particular parameters are what might have been affected, but in the absence of the accurate knowledge of what those parameters are, you use adaptive control in order to control the system reliably, even after after the attack is launched. Then the fifth one is robust control. So what is robust control? Remember we took the expectation operator here. I'm going to keep the same as min over gamma t but now I'm going to take max over WT in W of the summation of C subject to all these constraints, all these constraints that we talked about. So that's called a robust control. The difference between robust and optimization-based controller is in robust, you take the maximum over a certain noise profile in the optimization, you take expectation. So you kind of average out all the different noise profiles that will be there. In the robust control, you pick the worst noise, the worst noise profile, and then you optimize your system based on the worst noise that you can possibly see in your system. One important thing to remember, to note, in the context of robust control, is that you have to design the system in a way that you can implement the robust controller. What does that mean? How many people are there in this room right now? There are about 10 people, right? 
Oh, 11, including me. <laughs> so there are 11 people, including me in this room. Uh, this room is designed for, so the, the temperature of 72 degrees Fahrenheit will be maintained if there are zero people in the room, there are 11 people in the room, and there are 40 people in the room, okay? So actually the hardware of the room is designed for the worst case scenario that there'll be 40 people in the room, okay? And if they had not prepared the hardware accordingly, if they had you know, created a smaller unit or, uh, or just one air handling unit instead of, so we have four vents here, but instead of four vents, if we had only one vent, okay? Then we are not necessarily using it, we are not necessarily designing the system to take into account the fact that you could have a worst case noise of 40 people inside this, this room. So when we talk about robust, so a lot of the times, uh, in engineering system, you actually look at the worst case scenario and you design the system for the worst case scenario. So I'll give you another example. If you look at our energy systems, okay, the energy system are designed to serve the peak load in the summer. So the summer, if the summer temperature is, whenever there is a heat wave in the summer, that's the peak load on the system. How many days do you have heat wave in the summer? Four days, five days in a year? So the entire energy system is designed to serve four days. I mean, even on those four days, the peak time is 12 p.m. to 5 p.m., something in that particular range. So we have like 20 hours in a year when you will have peak load, and the entire system is designed to handle that particular peak load, okay? So it's the worst case. They look at the worst case situation, what's the maximum temperature that Ohio has seen over the last 100 years. They look at that temperature and they'll design the system so that the demand and that particular weather can be met in the entire state of Ohio. So that's an example of a design which is very robust to weather changes and weather patterns. Um, another example of robust control system is nuclear power plants because you know, accidents could be very disastrous. And I think Ohio has four or five nuclear plants, which is giving us electricity here. So those uh, systems are also designed to take into account the worst possible noise that can be implemented on that system. And they'll design the controller in a manner that they are fail safe under the worst possible noise uh, that the nuclear plant is going to see over their lifetime. And then the sixth one is resilient control. So resilient control is not as well defined, but the way I define resilient control and the way many other authors have defined resilient control is you look at the situation, you partition the, the state space into situations and depending on the situation, you will pick an appropriate control strategy. So my system is not under attack. I'm applying a specific control strategy. I'm applying a specific gamma T. Now I detected an attack. I'm going to switch gamma T to some other gamma T. Let's say gamma tilde T. And then the attack has changed. Now I'm going to switch the system again, switch the control policy again and put gamma bar T. And now the system is back to normal so I can go back to gamma of T. What is the problem with, why, why shouldn't we have resilient control everywhere? What is the issue with resilient control? It sounds so good, right? So if we are in this situation, we'll use this gamma t. If we are in this situation, we use some other gamma t. If we are in this situation, we'll use some other gamma t. So that sounds like a very good thing to do. So why don't we do that? Why don't we use resilient control everywhere? Computationally very expensive. Anything else? It's very case specific. Sorry? It's very case specific. Very case specific, uh, for sure. If there are only four situations that you had imagined, and there is a fifth situation that emerges, then what do you do? Good. Anything else? So it is not just computationally expensive, the system itself is expensive. 
So now you need to have more microcontrollers, you need to have more wiring, you need to have more sensors, you need to have more, all the paraphernalia that goes inside a control system. So that's why resilient control is very difficult. Um, it's very expensive, it's very case-to-case -case specific, and uh, that's why t so far it was very difficult to have resilient control because you know microprocessors were very limited in the amount of computations they can do. So nowadays, what people generally tend to do is they connect everything to cloud. So I don't know how many of you know, but now there is smart washing machine, smart dishwasher, smart fan, smart everything, like everything, all devices have become smart now. So now they can actually talk to the cloud, they can figure out what's happening on, in the cloud, and then they can get the control, updated control policy, and they can implement that control policy on the hardware. Okay, so it is possible now, but it wasn't possible five years ago or 10 years ago. Uh, and the reason why it is possible now is because you can actually offload the computation to the cloud. So a lot of the expensive stuff is happening on the cloud, and then you pass on the updated gamma T in the system. So that's resilient control. So, uh, so what we will do in the next class, uh, so I think the lead lag controller part is something that you have uh, studied as part of 3551. What I want to talk about is the optimization based gamma T. So we'll talk about optimization uh, in the next class. And then we will talk about dynamic programming, which is a way to solve this optimization without the expectation and without the noise. So I'm gonna remove the noise, remove the expectation and I'm going to solve this particular problem using what is known as a dynamic programming algorithm. And we'll design gamma t according to the dynamic programming algorithm. Specifically, we'll study a specific subclass of dynamic programming algorithm called LQR problem. So we'll talk about LQR problem and we'll, uh, we'll uh, study this. We'll spend maybe two or three classes on optimization based gamma t. Then I will talk about adaptive control. I'll give some comments on the robust control, but then I'll talk about adaptive control. Uh, so maybe uh, three classes on optimization-based gamma T and robust control-based gamma T. Then maybe a couple of classes on adaptive control-based gamma T. We'll not talk about resilient control uh, because resilient control is basically switching between this, this, and this, depending on the situation. So. So those are the things we will talk about uh, in the next five classes. After that, we will switch to probability and statistics. We'll talk about statistics, we'll talk about expectation, what this expectation means. And then we will uh, uh, talk about attack detection. And then we'll talk about attack mitigation. So mitigation basically means using some of these algorithms for mitigating the effects of attack. But like I mentioned in the first class, mitigation is always case specific. So we'll actually do case studies of, okay, if this is the attack, this is the system, then this is what we should do. This is the attack, this is the system, this is what we'll do. So we'll talk about it in those particular respect in that class. So, so all in all, that's our uh, process. Uh, this class finished early, but uh, We'll meet again on Wednesday. Thank you so much and uh, have a great uh, long weekend. Yes. Uh, what's maximization over a random variable mean? Because probability this is not a random variable here. You are looking at the worst case scenario. Okay. So number of people in this room, it's a random variable in reality, but we are looking at the worst situation, how many people will actually be in the room. So this room is designed for, I don't know, 40 people. So in the worst case, we will only see 40 people in the room. So the air conditioning is designed for 40 people in the room. And the logic and everything is designed for keeping in mind 40 people in the room. <laughs>